so excited to be talking with you, Kristen. And um, this book is just, I mean, I, I literally had a hard time getting a copy of it because everyone is trying to get a copy of it right now um, because of these times that we're living in. It's, it's pretty crazy and pretty timely, I think. Um, yeah, I'm super curious. You write this book about evangelicalism and a bit into fundamentalism. And I guess I'm curious, did you grow up in that? Uh, what, what came, what, what led you to, I guess, to doing this research and, and studying this topic in particular? Yeah, I didn't really grow up inside of evangelicalism, not, uh, not as far as I knew. I grew up in a conservative Christian home community in Northwest Iowa, uh, but it was a, a Dutch ethnic community. So I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church. My mom was an immigrant from the Netherlands. And when I was growing up, uh, you know, my religious community it really defined itself over against American evangelicalism over against American Christianity, you know, we were distinctively reformed, Dutch reformed. And so I certainly didn't consider myself an evangelical. Uh, that said, <laughs> looking back, I can see how uh, I was still influenced by American evangelicalism. So, you know, we listened to Christian radio, uh, Christian music. Uh, we had one bookstore in my hometown and it was a Christian bookstore. And so you needed a birthday present. You received a birthday present, right? It was, it was purchased at the Christian bookstore. And so I was actually, uh, immersed in the, the popular culture of evangelicalism, even though I didn't, uh, really identify as an evangelical. And I think that awareness, uh, is, is something that, that kind of frames the book frames the way I understand evangelicalism more broadly, that, it, that it is a consumer culture and, uh, that is this popular culture of evangelicalism that really does shape the values of, of, of many white evangelicals today. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's sort of even through reading the book, which I just, I, I loved. And uh, I guess the question is like, it's still hard to, to define. And that's sort of the point, I guess, what you're saying in the book too, especially early on is like it's kind of a hard term to define. How have you come to, to define evangelicalism or just that term evangelical. Um, yeah. And has it yeah. changed, I guess, have you seen it? Do you think it's changed over the course of history over the oh, last absolutely. 60, 70 years? Okay. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's changed over the course of the last three, 400 years. It's uh, the, the term is always, is, is always morphing. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm doing in this book is actually pushing back against some other historians who are trying to hold up a kind of essential definition of evangelical, one that that is valid across time and space. And uh, for me, that that um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, uh, and it certainly is not very useful for us to understand what we know as white evangelicalism today and for the last half century or so. Um, so, you know, these historians or evangelicals themselves, evangelical leaders will, will try to define or will define evangelicalism as a, a theology, as a, um, a set of a theological beliefs. And uh, so things like the centrality of the cross, crucicentrism, the um, authority of the scriptures and uh, conversionism, being born again, and then activism and acting out of these, these, these uh, impulses, these beliefs. And, um, and I mean, that's fine up to a certain extent, but it, uh, it ignores a lot of, of history, really it ignores how, how evangelicalism is also a historical movement, a cultural movement. And when we uh, understand it in this way, then we have to see um, that uh, it's, it's not simply a theology. In fact, many evangelicals today are not very theologically literate. Uh, and if you define evangelicalism theologically, you can put a lot of people into that bucket. So most black Protestants would count as evangelicals. Most, uh, global Christians would count as evangelicals, which is fine if, if you're, you know, kind of drawing the, the boundaries that way for various purposes, but to really understand white evangelicalism in American history, I think we have to understand it as a, as a historical and cultural movement. And so I ended up kind of backing into this understanding of evangelicalism as a consumer culture, uh, mm -hmm. as a, a series of networks and alliances 
And, um, and when I understand it this way, then, um, what we're looking at the last half century starts to really come into focus. It is predominantly a white religious movement, and it is a movement that is not always top down and not always theologically driven, but culturally, uh, driven, uh, cultural identity is at the heart. And it's, it's really kind of, uh, sustained, fostered and sustained through this massive evangelical popular culture. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's what like stood out so much in the book. Okay, I got it. This is like one of the first pages in and I hear I've seen so much on Twitter just about these, these stats. And I just I feel like I just want to hear more. I don't want to hear how this makes you feel and where and where this like, um, if this like was a big part of kind of like getting into some of this research or the study. But okay, so you say, more than any other, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but more than any other religious demographic in America, white evangelical Protestants support preemptive war, condone the use of torture, favor the death penalty. Uh, let's see, they're more likely than members of other faiths to own a gun. Um, more opposed to immigration reform, have more negative views on immigrants than any other religious demographic. Two, th two thirds support the border wall. Let's see, 68% of white evangelical Protestants more than any other demographic, do not think the United States has a responsibility to accept refugees, which is shocking to me. Um, more than half of white evangelical Protestants think a majority non-white US population would be a negative development. Um, they're more likely to refuse to see Islam as part of mainstream American society, to perceive natural conflict between Islam as demo and democracy. Um, let's see. White evangelicals believe that Christians in America face more discrimination than Muslims. And uh, more significantly, let's see, white evangelicals are significantly more authoritarian than other religious groups, and they express confidence in their religious leaders at a much higher rate than do members of other faiths. And yeah, something we talk about on this show a lot is kind of going back up the stream, I guess, like looking at yeah. where these, these are the beliefs, these are the practices, I guess, but then you go back up the stream and say, where is this coming from, I guess? And we're always looking at like theology. And I know you've said it's, you know, it's not primarily theology, it's more of a cultural thing, but just wondering if you have any insight into maybe where, what does this mean? Like up, upwards of the stream a bit, where do you think these ideas are, are coming from, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think what what's striking about many of those statistics is that, you know, when evangelicals self-identify, uh, first and foremost, as Bible-believing Christians, right? Yeah. And when you read that list, you can see, like, <laughs> a lot of these things are really going against some pretty direct teachings of the scriptures. And yeah. uh, and, and so that's, that's just a really... Uh, you know, important point to make. And, um, and so, yeah, where does it come from then? So if it's not from the plain reading of the scriptures, uh, where do these, uh, where do these beliefs come from now? Full disclosure, that section and, uh, that portion of the introduction of Jesus and John Wayne was initially my conclusion. So I felt like I had earned the right. So I traced the history to get to that point. And then that was the, you know, boom, kind of takeaway. Here's where we see it all, you know, uh, really play out in, in contemporary issues, this long history that I traced. And then, uh, in the, the, uh, editorial phase, my editor said, okay, this is great stuff. I want you to move it all right up into the introduction and find something oh, else to do for your conclusion. And so okay. that was like wow. really jarring yeah. for me because I thought, you know, these are some shocking statistics and it's pretty harsh reality. And if I can bring my readers to that point, you know, that's one thing Th then they're with me, they've seen, I've proven this. And instead I just put it all right up front, front loaded it. Um, and so it's a very jarring opening of the book. And then what I do is I, I trace that history. History. And so I show how, uh, you know, particularly in the Cold War era, that evangelicals come to really link up their understanding of Orthodox Christianity with Cold War militarism, with this us versus them mentality. And this is linked with uh, Christian nationalism, uh, the idea that America is a Christian nation and needs to be defended as such. And all of this is also linked together with gender traditionalism, as they'll call it, or uh, very distinct gender roles um, between men and women. And for men, what that looks like is um, God filled men with testosterone 
sense that they can be masculine protectors, protectors of faith, family, and nation. Again, in this Cold War context, that can involve a military defense. It must have involve a military defense. Um, and and then it, it can be extrapolated into the culture wars and so on. So that's really where this starts. And, and the rest of the book really traces this, um, this militant faith that's very much in, in us versus them, use violence to achieve order when necessary for the good of Christianity. Yeah, it's just, it's so crazy to me that essentially what you're saying is it, it didn't, it didn't start with the Bible, really. It didn't yeah. start with theology. Right, that, right. That's surprising to you. I don't know. It is to me. Yeah, you know, and it's not that there's no theology or that you won't find any Bible passages, but, uh, you know, the scriptures are, are really read through these uh, cultural and political lenses. And that's why I you know, make the point later in the book that uh, let's, let's take the issue of immigration of, you know, we have welcoming the stranger or, uh, you know, uh, refugees and, 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 you know, you can, you can open the Bible together and say, but look, look at all these passages, look at it's right in front of us. And I mean, we know that those, those conversations go nowhere, uh, that we are all of us approaching the scriptures through, um, our cultural lenses, through our pre-existing loyalties. Now, ideally as Christians, we like to claim that we'll, our, our, you know, cultural loyalties will be refined by our faith and that the scripture will challenge our beliefs and, and that we will, you know, align ourselves more fully with the word of God. Uh, but in reality, I think that oftentimes our, our, our loyalties, um, predispose us to certain passages and cer certain interpretations. Now, some traditions are more open about that. Um, evangelicalism in particular is kind of in denial about that, right? Evangelicals have long just championed this, this notion of, you know, every individual has access to God's truth, the plain reading of the scriptures. And it's again, just, we're just plain old Bible believing Christians. That's all. Uh, and so there, there's an, a, a kind of blindness to the way in which culture does shape theology and uh, does shape the way they, they read the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing I was struck by a similar vein, I guess, is that just some of the traditions, I guess, that, that, I grew up with as, as traditions or things that felt so, um, well, yes, of course, like it's always been that way. Just haven't really been that way that long. And that's, I think your book kind of was shining a light on that. And some of them I kind of knew, but then I just have this list here of like Billy Graham uh, was a lifelong registered Democrat until was it sixties or seventies, somewhere in there? But lifelong. No, he, he, he stay, stayed with it. He was a, he, okay. he never switched so not just officially. Okay. I can't okay. say, you know, how he voted. Uh, I mean, his son will speak for him on that, but uh, no. Uh, so you know, yes, most Southern white folks were Democrats up until the party realignment in the 60s, 70s, really not completed until the 80s, if then. Uh, yeah, so so th <laughs> things haven't always been the way they are now. Yeah, then I think in that same section that you talk about the Southern Baptist Convention, they had pressed for expanding even abortion access Yes. I and mean, still in a limited way, but expanding what was available at the time back in 71. And then uh -huh. one nation under God being added to the pledge in 54. And then in God, we tr trust to the money as well. And then kind of this idea of the traditional family structure of the male breadwinner that sort of coming around in the 20s, but then not really peaking until like the 50s or 60s. <laughs> but these are things I think, when you, especially when you talk about like, make America great again, there's always this like, kind of feel of like we need to get back to the the 50s or the 40s or yes. something like that and uh that that was a relatively new these are new phenomenons at that at that time yeah, yeah exactly curious. exactly yeah like it feels like this holding like and i guess there's a question here somewhere but there's this there's this feeling around evangelicalism or just christianity sometimes in general in america of like kind of defending or conserving holding like you know holding that line um yeah I, first of all are there any other things and maybe I didn't bring up there that uh, maybe that aren't as traditional as we as we thought and the other things oh, yeah. that you discovered. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was really the point of my whole first chapter was just to to uh, destabilize kind of you know, the, the truths that we all think we know. Uh, and so things like, uh, you know, Christian masculinity, uh, you know, what is Christian manhood like? I 
I wanted to just have a quick glimpse back to, well, in the 19th century, it wasn't this rugged, tough guy Christianity. To be a Christian man was to be a gentleman, to, to exhibit mm -hmm. self-restraint. Uh, and, and that was, you know, a, a real tenet of Victorian, uh, Christian manhood. Of course you had the Southern variant, which was a little different. That was a little bit more, uh, kind of this, this more dominant patriarchal, uh, mode of, of Christian ev and evangelical masculinity. Um, but then you saw a change over times so that by the early 20th century in the North and the South, you have a kind of muscular Christianity, but there too, that wasn't just the province of conservative. Protestants, not at all. Liberal Protestants embraced this muscular Christianity. In World War I, liberal Protestants embraced militarism and Christian nationalism, whereas some conservative Protestants resisted militarism and conservative uh, or, and Christian nationalism, right? So all of this stuff, uh, it, it just, just really destabilized and, and to understand that things haven't always looked like they have now so that we can start asking, okay, when did this alignment really come into being? This where we see conservative conservative Protestants as Christian nationalists, um, pro-militarists, and gender traditionalists, uh, you know, in, in their terminology. And, and that really is, is in the 1940s, uh, 50s, and really crystallizes as a kind of oppositional stance in the 1960s, when much of the rest of the country is starting to question all of these values. Militarism in the wake of Vietnam, you know, we have the civil rights moving, disrupting the status quo, particularly in the South. You have the feminist movement, and that's when conservative evangelicals really double down on these, you know, quote unquote, traditional values. Wow. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Like, it, you'd be hard pressed, I think, to convince someone today that these are relatively new ideas, tr traditions, I guess. Um, yeah. Well, evangelicals have been really good at branding them, right? <laughs> right. The, to think of wow, the words, yeah. you know, traditional values. Uh, evangelicals in the early 20th century, you know, embraced this this idea of uh, old time religion. That's who they were. Now, you know, the modernists. Uh, uh, weren't weren't claiming to be old time religion. They were saying that Christianity has to adapt to modern times, but uh, that obscures the fact then that evangelicals, conser you know, quote unquote, conservative evangelicals, even fundamentalists, were actually very innovative in their own you know adaptation mm -hmm. of, of Christianity to the modern era. Uh, they were you know embracing modern advertising techniques. They were getting rid of old denominational structures, and uh, you know and and you using kind of uh, mass media and so on. Uh, and, and all of these things are really disruptive uh, and innovate, innovative. And yet uh, they are branded as old time religion. We are the traditional Christianity, right? We are and everything else is and is a, a kind of distortion of true Christianity. And so this is absolutely the story that evangelicals presented to the world. And they were very good at kind of capturing that, um, that identity as, as we are the traditional Christians. Uh, we have traditional gender roles. We, you know, we, we're kind of um, holding on to this truth. We are the faithful remnant. Wow. The faithful remnant. Yeah. And then there's like this, I guess, persecution complex that comes along with it too. Like feeling like, because I think some would even describe themselves as like being the minority almost. Like they're the, they're the ones that everyone's trying to angry at and trying to like kick out of positions. Of, but it, it's like, they're the most powerful block. Even when you look at like 81% voting for, everyone knows that stat, right? Of voting for Donald Trump. I mean, what other block of, of any group of people has voted in that, in that consistent um, manner before, but then the, there's like this language around it from that group, I guess that, you know, look at, look at us. Like we can't even, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to, it's like prayer in schools and just these different things. Um, yeah, just, it's just so crazy that it's like literally the opposite, but they'll, they'll talk as if there's this like minority status. Yeah. And I think that part of that comes from this sense of displacement, uh, because in the 1940s, that's when evangelicals came together, uh, you know, these conservative Protestants, um, fundamentalists included, um, not the most extreme fundamentalists, they had their own organization, but you know, conservative Protestants came together and said, okay, 
we need to band together because um, they hadn't been able to seize control of most major denominations in the 1920s with the fundamentalist modernist split. And so they, they didn't disappear. They just went off and started their own churches and their own um, Bible schools and their, you know, their, their own kind of small networks. And then in the early forties, they said, um, strength in numbers. We really need to band together. Uh, because again, we, we, we are the faithful remnant. We have this truth and we really need to spread, you know, our Christianity across the nation. And, um, and so this was a very strategic plan and they, they decided to have, they needed magazines with, um, you know, tens of thousands of subscribers. They needed to take to the airwaves. They had all these great plans and, um, miraculously almost it worked it worked phenomenally well so in 15 years they were really kind of at the center of things they had billy graham with access to the white house and this was the post-war era and so their values of you know traditional gender roles were pretty much in keeping with you know this is baby boom era uh this was the cold war consensus so cold war militarism nothing that unique about that and so they they definitely had moved from kind of the margins too close to the center of things um, by the 1950s and early 60s. And that's why the 60s was so disruptive. When you have a civil rights movement and feminism and the anti-war movement, and then suddenly, you know, just when they had kind of made it, then the rest of the country, or at least a pretty good portion says, nah, you know, <laughs> this isn't where we want to go. You, you don't represent us. And so I think there's this, this uh, lingering feeling of loss of resentment, of entitlement that we ought to be at the center of things. Um, and we are the, you know, the Christians at the center of Christian America, and we need to reclaim that and we need to restore that. Yeah, and it feels like one of those rallying topics, I guess, was abortion. And yeah. and it, it still it still is, but the pro-life movement and the moral majority, like um I, I, I'm just, I'm curious if you have any insight onto it, like why abortion, why did pro-life, why did that become the, the rallying cry, I guess? Yeah, it didn't initially, right? It wasn't, it wasn't at the origins of the religious right. Uh, as you suggested in the early seventies, the SBC was, you know, uh, pro-choice. Uh, there's a, a Christianity Today special issue in, I think in 1968, the question of, you know, abortion, right or wrong, kind of, and the, the answer was, it's it's really complicated. And, and yes, it can be necessary in many situations. And, you know, it's not ideal, but uh, it's, you know, it's a broken world and, uh, and yes, it, it, it is necessary. Uh, so that's late sixties and early seventies. And, uh, and so, in the in the seventies, for much of the seventies, abortion was really the the issue for Catholics. Catholics were staunchly anti-abortion, and evangelicals and Catholics weren't great friends at that time. We are now we we see this alliance between conservative evangelicals and conservative Catholics, and that was initially a political alliance, and that kind of grows out of this era. But it took a while for evangelicals to kind of get on board with abortion. Now, I, I want to. Um, add that there is a tradition within Protestantism, both liberal and conservative Protestantism of um, kind of anti-abortion, uh, even anti-birth control, if you go to earlier in the century. So, so it's not that it was completely absent, but it, there was not a, a kind of unified view. It, there was a lot of, of different views on, on abortion. It was a very difficult issue. Um, and uh, the, the, issue that um, many historians suggest really mobilized the religious right first was uh, segregationism. And when the federal government in the South uh, mandated desegregation of schools, that's when we see a lot of private Christian academies being established. And uh, when the government came after those, that really mobilized uh, uh, the, the religious right. Uh, so at Bob Jones University, uh, you know, Jerry Falwell Sr. was pro-segregationist uh, initially back in the day. And, uh, and so if we put race and anti-civil rights activism, you know, kind of before abortion, then it's in the late 1970s that abortion uh, is identified by strategists as this is really an issue that could unite uh, the religious right. And by that time, I think... Um, uh, abortion came to be linked with feminism. 
And by the late 70s, evangelicals had, uh, conservative evangelicals had clearly identified uh, feminism as a threat to society, as a threat to morality. And so I think abortion became a political issue and um, probably the mobilizing political issue for many conservative Protestants because of the way in which it was linked to feminism and to the purported rejection of God-ordained traditional femininity, traditional um, women's roles. Yeah, I'm curious if you have, for someone who's still, um, maybe abortion is the last issue they're holding on to, and the, only, the last thing that, that keeps them uh, voting conservative, I just, this is like a, an aside, but what would you say to, to someone like that? Well, I think that, I mean, I, I respect that, uh, that it's, it's a really important issue. And for people who believe that abortion is ending the life of a human being, um, you know, I respect that that is, uh, a, a, maybe the issue. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I wouldn't try to say that that doesn't matter. Um, what I, I would suggest is um, that many people claim that that's true, that that is the issue. Um, it's very important because it provides this kind of moral cover to the entire kind of uh, conservative agenda um, because of that one issue. But I do have a suspicion and actually survey data backs me up pretty powerfully here that if we could somehow wave a magic wand and remove abortion from the like, from the political landscape, abortion doesn't exist. I think we would see very few voters uh, switch sides, actually, uh, because uh, if you look at survey data, abortion is um, way down on the list for American voters generally and for evangelical voters. Like it comes down below the, you know, the economy, foreign policy, like all, I think it's like 12 or so on the list uh, of, of most important issues um, for voters. And, um, and that always strikes me as, you know, that's not what I hear anecdotally at yeah. all. And at the same time, you know, if you do take uh, abortion off the table uh, and you start asking, well, what do you think about um, the military? What do you think about foreign policy? What do you think about immigration control? What do you think about tax policy? All of these things, there's like, they're likely to still be aligned uh, with, uh, you know, conservative Republican agenda. And so I see abortion as one facet of uh, this larger, uh, you know, kind of set of issues. Um, but it's, it's not, maybe it's a linchpin, but I think it's just one facet. And if you remove that, I still think that the structure, um, persists. So essentially if, if Donald Trump was the exact same person that he is, and he was pro-choice, you think he potentially still gets elected? I, you know, I think that abortion was the signal issue to conservative evangelicals with Donald Trump, um, that he was going to be one of them sure, or close yeah. enough. Right. You know, so, so I can't really say that, that, that seems, um, what, I, what more likely I think is that at this point, if he would shift on that view, he would lose some, some supporters, but I don't think he would, he would use, uh, lose most of his base, but, um, you know, that back in 2015, and early 2016, that was a key question. Uh, you know, who is this guy? Can we trust him? Um, he wasn't he just a Democrat? Wasn't he just pro-choice? And so that was a, a signal that, oh no, he'll he'll be one of us. Uh, but that wasn't, you know, every Republican candidate was uh uh, you know, anti-abortion. Uh, and so what was it about Trump that appealed to them? You know, that that got him in the door, but I don't think that was the the secret to his sure. success with evangelicals. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, so this term militant masculinity, that that seems to be um, what you identify as kind of the biggest issue that, that's led evangelicalism to where it is, and it's sort of how we got here. Um, yeah, how do, how do you define militant masculinity? Yeah, so it's it's really just uh, you know, looking. It, it starts with patriarchy uh, and starts with a, a, a pretty rigid patriarchy. So masculine authority, uh, but this isn't just kind of masculine authority in the church, uh, and it's not just masculine authority in the home. It does link to this this idea that I referred to earlier of, of the stark gender difference 
that men and women have just very, very distinct roles. You know, so somebody like James Dobson will frequently remind people that every cell of their bodies is unique, you know, is different. Uh, and so, so you have this stark gender binary. So for women, their job is to be submissive, to be, you know, sweet and feminine, vulnerable in need of protection. And that's where men come in. So men's role is to be strong, is to be aggressive when necessary so that they can, they can serve the, the, their, their role as, as protector and provider. Um, and provider becomes less and less important actually, in, in terms of their rhetoric, in terms of the identity of, of Christian masculinity, but this protector really becomes kind of the, 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 the key marker of masculinity. And so men have to be strong. They have to be rugged. And there are so many forces that are going to work against that. So feminism, liberalism, political correctness, right? All again, the whole facet here, uh, yeah. the whole, the whole constellation of issues, right? All of these are working against. And so we need to, we need to toughen up our boys. Um, and we need to toughen up our rhetoric and we need to be ready to fight. We need to fight real wars, we need to fight the culture wars. And um, this ideal of, of kind of what it, it means to be a Christian man ends up shaping what it is to be a Christian, right? And so yeah. what, what's really interesting is um, how, you know, passages of the scriptures, how Christian virtues become gendered. So the fruit of the spirit, right, they're, they're feminine, self-restraint and you know, gentleness and kindness. The Bible just says this is this is the you know fruit of the spirit of uh, of Christ and and uh, it doesn't say that this is good for the ladies, uh, but you know that's how it's interpreted. So th that's fine, you know, for for you know the feminine sort, but you can't defend your church, you can't defend your family and your nation if if you're turning the other cheek. No, 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 forget that. That's not what we're talking about here, right? So it ends up changing the faith itself. Jesus, Jesus gets transformed into this rugged warrior Christ who's gonna slay his enemies, right? Instead of the Jesus of the gospels, the suffering servant. And so this, this idea of what it is to be a Christian man ends up, uh, it, it is a very militant conception. And then it ends up really transforming the faith itself, or uh, as I put it, corrupting the faith itself. Yeah, wow. Um, and, it, and it seems like kind of in the, the gender, race, and class, like of those three things, you you kind of land on gender being the biggest factor. Um, yeah, how, how did you come to see, I guess, gender as the, the biggest problem in evangelicalism and th that kind of led us here? I mean, I, I think it's pretty, it's pretty clear, but what, what from the the, the data, what from like your, the history, like what, what led you to, to feel like that was the biggest thing, this militant masculinity? Yeah. Gender is the thread that I pull through, but it is inseparable from race. Uh, I mean, class too, but, but I, I really, really keep race at the forefront because this idea of uh, evangelical masculinity is very much a white uh, masculinity, a white patriarchy. Uh, and, uh, and that is evident in so many ways. So the heroes that they look to men like Teddy Roosevelt, well, what was Ro Roosevelt known for, you know, subduing the savages out in the West and then American empire and the Spanish American war, um, you know, the title of the book, Jesus and John Wayne, John Wayne becomes this kind of icon, not just of American manhood, but of this conservative Christian masculinity. Well, what's John Wayne known for in his films, you know, again, the, the cowboys subduing the, the Indians and then. And, uh, the Japanese in Sands of Iwo Jima, and then uh, you know the North Vietnamese in uh, the Green Berets, and this this consistent the white man, the heroic white man, and it is he who gets to use violence, God given violence, in order to preserve order, in order to protect. And, and so um, over and over again, this um, idealized masculinity, it it is a it is a white uh, masculinity. Uh, and, and you can see that, you know, not just in its symbolism, but also in its politics. And so things like, you know, law and order politics, right? that's, that's a very racialized concept in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and, and that is what evangelicals come to embrace. Again, it's, it's white law enforcement, white law and order um, to subdue civil rights activists and, uh, and people of color. And, and you just see this pattern repeat over and over again. Um, and so, 
in, in the literature, um, men who are not white are often perceived as threats. So Islamic men, you know, very dangerous threats, black men perceived as threats. You can see this in statistics around Black Lives Matter and white law enforcement and things like that. Uh, you know, immigration also, um, you know, these are um, non-white men are perceived as threats, whereas white men are perceived as, as heroes. And it is their God-given duty to defend uh, their nation and their families. Yeah. How do you, we, you know, we talked earlier at the beginning of this interview and it's the beginning of Jesus and John Wayne. You talk about this two thirds of the white Protestants, um, you know, and then there's that long list that I said, I'm, I, I think about the, the one third sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I think about, you know, what is, because they're all, they'd all be defined as evangelical. And you talk about those four tenets of, you know, mm -hmm. atonement and, um, you know, basically evangelizing and, and sharing mm -hmm. them and the other ones. But so they would largely believe, they'd claim the same religious text. They'd believe probably the same tenets. Um, I don't think either of them would probably have any major issues with the other's theology. They're going to believe the same, same things for the most part. What do you feel like separates the, the one third from the, from the two thirds? I, I guess I've, I've thought of it sometimes like, um, and you can correct me on this. Like, I spent so long trying to craft this question because I feel like the two thirds, like their leader, is kind of the Franklin Graham. Um, you know, the, their, their church will go maybe right to the mm -hmm. line of losing their nonprofit status by getting pretty political. And then the the one third feels like the John Pipers, and um, that maybe it's it's more the gospel focus. And like, hey, we'll we'll say some things, but we're not going to like come right out and like maybe say exactly who to vote for. It's more about, you know, let's be politically homeless and, but, but they still end up kind of voting the same way sometimes. I don't know. I, I'm just curious, like what, how you think of that? Yeah. Well, I think we have to broaden the spectrum a little bit too. So, you know, we have the evangelical left uh, that is, you know, presumably making it part of that 20% of white evangelicals who didn't vote for Donald Trump. And they've been hanging on kind of on the edges for a very long time, you know, Jim Wallace and Sojourners you know, going back sure, sure. Um, for decades and uh, a more progressive evangelical um, faction has, has persisted a minority voice. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, David Swartz's book on the evangelical left is called Moral Minority. And, uh, and so, so they exist. And then, you know, the folks that you're talking about, somebody like John Piper, I'd place him like right, right in the, in the middle between the, you know, he, he's definitely more conservative, but, but what you have now is uh, a, a small number of vocal uh, conservative Republicans who are uh, you know, standing against <clears throat> Trump, standing against the Trump administration. Uh, some of them are doing so boldly. Many of them are doing so very cautiously and sporadically. Uh, and, and so it's a really interesting moment right now to watch the alliances shift potentially. Uh, before, the, you know, before 2016, the alliances were pretty clear. Uh, and so you had the conservative networks, uh, places like the Gospel Coalition linked with the SBC, you know, linked with the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood and, mm -hmm. you know, John Piper, part of this mix. And that that's really, that's that's the networks that, that I'm looking at in Jesus and John Wayne. And, and, and they're all, you know, th those are conservative white evangelicals. And then over on the other side, you've got maybe the University Press. Uh, Christianity Today, somewhere kind of in the middle, and um, and you know the far left, you've got sojourners type thing. It'd be fun to just really map sure. out evangelicalism, yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, out. yeah, and but you kind of had liberals and conservatives, uh, or progressives and conservatives, and um, conservatives in particular, I think, would put up boundaries, and so many of the the progressives were were deemed um, kind of they were disfellowshipped, right? They were. Uh, Lifeway Christian books would stop selling their books. Uh, the conference circuits, right? No longer, you're not getting your invite. Uh, farewell, Rob Bell kind of thing. Uh -huh. yes. All right, so kick them out. Now, I think that uh, in the wake of 2016 and especially in the wake of 2020 and then January 6th of this year, I think that some of those um, boundaries are being redrawn or at least reconsidered because you have a group of conservatives 
who, you know, maybe even voted for Trump in 2016 and, and did so ambivalently, you know, many evangelicals were not all that ambivalent, but there were some who were, or some who just couldn't bring themselves to. And now they're looking around and saying, you know, what is the essence of evangelicalism? What, you know, I'm, I, I can't go along with this. And, and so now they're experiencing from Trump's base evangelicals, what progressive evangelicals had experienced, you know, in generations earlier of being excluded, of being kind of defined out of the fold and how exactly those lines will be redrawn is, is an an open question as far as I'm concerned, but it's really fascinating to watch this um, play out. Um, And, and I'm not sure where, where we'll end up. Yeah. Yeah, I almost want to get, I'm trying to think, I'll edit this out. I'm trying to think if I want to get in more just because I, I, you know, it's just interesting to me, the, the churches that I grew up in, the churches that I was a part of and planting and um, they, I feel like they would end up, they would think they're part of the one third, yeah. but they, they end up voting with the two thirds. So they're, yes. they're going to get up and, and it's almost frustrating to me. I listen to the sermons and it's like, uh, you know, hey, we need both on the right and on the left. Like, hey, there's issues on both sides here. We need to be focused on Jesus. We need to be focused on the gospel. But I know if you were to pull the church more than at least the first time around, they were probably right at the 81%. Yeah. They were probably, they were right, right there as far as the church is concerned. And then second time around, they probably at least the majority would have voted for Trump. So it's like, what's the difference? Is there a difference like with these? And that's where I guess I go to John Piper. He's not and you, you mentioned in the book a couple of times, but he's not like that politically act, not like a Franklin Graham, maybe. No. Um, but I, certainly, you know, his church probably, and the churches that kind of follow um, John Piper's ministry and end up aligning with, with him. Um, so maybe it's more like a perception thing, not wanting to be included in, in that group, but you end up still being there. Maybe there's no difference, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think there, there is a, a, you know, we're not like those people, but I mean, in, in voting is not a, you know, a, a precise measure when you've got, you know, essentially two choices that that's maybe not the best measure. I'd, I'd go, I'd go into some of the other polling data then, right. You know, like this list that you, you, you shared to begin with, you know, those sorts of questions of, um, you know, what are we really looking at? What are the loyalties here? What are the, you know, so, so it might, and then, and then also I'd, I'd look at a divide between, um, often oftentimes between pastors and, and members of churches. And so mm-hmm. from the pulpit, you might hear, yep, neither left nor right. God is not a Democrat or a Republican. And yet the um, evangelical culture that people in the pews are consuming um, day in, day out, you know, Christian radio, um, it may, they're reading world magazine, um, listening to, you know, Christian contemporary music. Um, now what happens if a, a favorite, you know, Christian contemporary recording artist comes out as anti-Trump, not good for sales. And so most of them stay very, very quiet on yeah. that front. Right. And this is, this is again, kind of this consumer culture. Um, what happens with the, when a Christian magazine comes out uh, against Trump, you lose a ton of subscribers. And uh, it, 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 you know, it's been interesting to see that play out at Christianity Today and then play out in a very different way at Christian Post. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, so the truth is pastors have far less authority uh, over their um, members of their churches uh, than they imagined they had. And that's something that um, has been fascinating. And pastors will say that, you know, like, I, I, I can't lead these people because if I try to, they're going to fire me, right? So who's actually shepherding the flock here? And many pastors have come to realize that their own authority is, uh, is, uh, really constrained in this moment and that members of their churches are following other leaders. Uh, and, and, and so there's, there's a real crisis of authority, I think right now in many, in many churches and the pastors feel captive. Well, it's really hard, I guess, if you're, you know, you got an hour, 30 minutes or whatever, exactly. and then Fox news has exactly every evening in your, in your home. And so you're hearing, and not even just Fox news, but you mentioned Christian radio and, yeah. um, but yeah, Fox, I mean, Fox News, News, talk radio. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is, this is pervasive 
And it, it all is kind of mutually reinforcing, right? Because if you do try to disrupt this, if you do, then, then you're very quickly on the outs and, and the pressures to conform, whether it's in your own local church or in your families, or certainly if, if um, money is on the line, if your livelihood is on the line, as it is in many of these organizations and institutions, you know, you will lose your job, you will lose your subscribers, you will lose your donors. I mean, talking parachurch organizations. So there are a lot of pressures to uh, stay quiet and, and to conform. Yeah. Okay. Before we, before we wrap up, I have a couple tweets. Just, I, I like to dig into guest tweets and just see if you can add, <laughs> add some more, add some flair, add some more information um, to, to, to these. But um, one is just, um, I guess I feel like the, the best we've heard after four years of what we experienced with Trump, which as you're describing the book is a culmination of, it's kind of the, the, this is, this is what we get after all these decades of um, kind of leading here with the evangelical culture. But I feel like the best we've heard is kind of this, like, it's not, it's not like people apologizing for, for supporting him. It's kind of this, like, I, well, I don't support his lifestyle. And I don't like the way he talks, you know, I'm not like, and it's like, you kind of have to, cause you know, I guess that you can't really just like stand up and defend the guy. You have to talk about how you don't like him. But um, yeah, you had this tweet um, where you're you retweeted. It's, Caitlin, is it Beatty? I never know how Beatty. to say her last name. Beatty, okay. Yeah. You retweeted Caitlin Beatty. Um, on days like today, I scan my Trump supporting friend's social media to see if there's any remorse uh, and voices of restraint. I've been doing this for four years, nothing. Yeah, and I think just a lot of our listeners would feel that same way. Just curious if you have any more thoughts or want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, that that's true. I, um, I, I've been tracking this very closely for um, four plus years now. And, you know, after the election, I thought, okay, okay, so you've vanquished Hillary Clinton. She's, she's gone. She's off. You know, that was a big figure. You know, how could we possibly vote for her? Um, you know, holding our noses to vote for Trump. And I thought, okay, let's see this. Let's see this. Now your guys, you know, he is your guy now. He's in office. What are you going to do? How are you going to rein him in? How are you going to, you know, none of that. The only voices speaking out clearly uh, against Donald Trump after he was elected president uh, from within the evangelical fold, from what I could tell were those who were already speaking out against him before he was yeah. elected president. And I watched right time and again and again, and we had the Brett Kavanaugh and we had Roy Moore and we had you know, so many, and, and I mean, it's the same voices. So Beth Moore out in front and, you know, but she had expressed reservations long before and the supporters, uh, you know, just, just crickets. And, and this is not just on the national level, but social media is great for, you know, research purposes. Cause you know, there's all these networks. I'm like, okay, let me go over to these folks and see what they're saying. And these folks over here. And yeah, yeah. As you said, the, the, uh, sentiment of, well, you know, it'd be good if he didn't tweet so much. Like, like that's the yeah, problem. Right. The problem that he's on Twitter <laughs> instead of you know everything that he is, you know, his his agenda, his 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 policies, his his moral center, like all of these things uh, that that seems somehow off limits. So yes, that I, I watch very closely, and my guess is I don't know if that tweet was on January sixth, but uh, probably uh, just yep. after. Yeah. Yep, January sixth. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I feel the same way. Um, okay. Well, just uh, wrapping up here, you know, you do all this research, you, you discover, maybe, you, maybe you already had this hunch that militant masculinity or that gender was going to be a, a big part of this. And just reading the book, I just, I, I got just really sad, I guess, reading a lot of pretty horrible quotes from different yeah. men. Um, and there's a few women too, but just about, about women in the book. And then I guess, just the, the thought as I'm reading this is like, as a, as a woman, how, how did this feel, I guess, to do this research yeah. and just to read these things and, and discover that this is sort of what has been the problem and yeah. sort of is the problem now? How did that feel? So I started this research more than 15 years ago, and then I ended up setting it aside for a couple of reasons. One was it was just so depressing. It was so frustrating it made me really angry. And I, I honestly thought, is this where I want to spend the next few years of my life yeah. in, in this um, really revolting space and being incredibly angry at fellow Christians? That, that was a very 
uh, active question for me. And then there's also this nagging question of, you know, this is really extreme stuff that I'm seeing very misogynistic and, and, you know, militaristic and, um, is it, is it fringe or is it mainstream? <laughs> you know, this was a question. And so I ended up for a variety of reasons, setting the, the research aside for a while until the fall of 2016. Oh. Um, but then when I picked it back up again, yes, it was heavy. It was heavy to research this and huge shout out to my three research assistants, my Calvin students who, who walked this journey with me and who read some really terrible things. And we were kind of each other's support group through this. You know, I would check in with them regularly. I, I'd have to ask, are you okay reading some of this, you know, on the abuse, oh. on uh, just the this misogyny and um, and racism, and and so so we helped each other through, and uh, it I, I was angry at times when I was researching. I was angry at times when I was writing. That probably comes through in places, but it also felt cathartic to because I'd been observing this for a long time. And um, it felt cathartic to be able to put it all down on paper and to be able to connect the dots. And then, and I, I didn't actually think that I could change minds by writing this book. Um, maybe very early on, I thought I could. And then the more research I, I did, the more I realized this is so deeply embedded. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to disrupt this, but I want to testify. I, I want to name this. I want to hold it up for all of us to see. And, and that's what I can do here. And so it actually felt really empowering to get to connect these dots, to get to um, speak back to um, uh, th these power structures, to these abusers of power. And, and I, that's, I think, comes through in the tone of the book. Uh, there's been some discussion about the tone of this book. Um, it's been described as urgent and sharp elbowed. And I, I like that a lot. I think that's, that's accurate. It was yeah. really important to me to not show deference uh, because I saw time and again in evangelical communities, how abusers were protected and how those in power were shown all sorts of deference and ended up getting away with all sorts of terrible things. Um, and, and their followers would, you know, cover up and try to protect their witness, protect the witness of the church, protect the brand and, um, and really terrible things happened. And I thought I want no part in that. And so I decided I was not going to show deference to these folks. And, uh, and that, that really the tone kind of came from that emotion. I think, um, just wanting to, to say things very plainly and, um, and, and, and hold it up for all to see and a, a kind of, you know, accountability, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And th thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, you say that, I don't know if it's going to change minds or whatever, but we just having something like this where you can, I think for all of us who have felt this or have seen this, it's, it's so helpful to have this to be like, you just don't feel as crazy. You don't feel as yes. alone to know that someone is saying this. It's felt like this, but someone's saying this. Um, at the, at the end of the book, I'm just going to read a quote. You say, understanding the catalyzing role militant Christian masculinity has played over the past half century is uh, critical to understanding American evangelicalism today and the nation's fractured political landscape. Appreciating, appreciating how this ideology developed over time is also essential for those who wish to dismantle it. What was once done might also be undone. And uh, yeah, so if, if masculinity, this militant masculinity has been the problem have you been able to get any words or yeah, I guess for what, where can we can go from here or what you see as some solutions to this? Yeah. You know, in the end, the book isn't, isn't ultimately about masculinity as much as it's about power and the relationship between mm -hmm. Christianity and power. Masculinity is just one of the main ways in which power is, sure. is kind of wielded. Uh, and, and so, so ultimately it comes to, uh, it, I think the challenge is for all of us to rethink, um, this relationship of, of, of Christianity and power. What is the gospel message? What is the, the model of Christ and, you know, a, a, a Christ who divests himself of power, um, mm -hmm. and, and offers himself for us. And we are called to follow that Christ, the suffering servant, to take up our crosses. And, and to me, that has always been the, uh, what is most amazing about Christianity. That's really the core of my, my belief as a Christian. 
And uh, from that place, it's hard for me to get to a, a Christianity that grasps at power, a coercive Christianity, uh, a Christianity that wants, you know, it, I mean, it, it's biblical. And this is the, you know, what, what in the Old Testament, the Israelites kept doing over and over again, and then they wanted their king. And then, and then, you know, sure. in, in the time of Christ, they wanted the Messiah that was the worldly leader, right? This is, this is, I'm a Calvinist, so I can just say this, this is just, you know, this is uh, original sin or this is human depravity or, or whatever. Like we're all prone to this. We are, we're all prone to grasping uh, at power and, and then justifying it. Um, but the thing about Christianity is that it, it works against that. It ought to. And, and so I think that an answer uh, or, 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 or what we need to pursue to undo this is really, really be self-critical about, um, about power and about how, how we use power about who gets power and, um, and, and what the essence of Christianity really is. And I will say that, um, although I didn't have much hope when I finished the book, uh, <laughs> And I only gave that last sentence because my editor made me, uh, he said I, it was too dark and I needed to give my readers just mm. a little something to hold on to. And so I finally gave him that sentence. He said, okay, good enough. But, um, but it is, it is true. I think it is that if you understand this history, um, like you said, you know, like I'm not the crazy one here. I've heard that yeah. from so many readers because it's just befuddling otherwise. And if you can see, aha, this is how this came to be. And it was not inevitable and choices were made along the way, often by very powerful people and often to become even more powerful to enhance their power. Wow. And once you see yeah. that, then, um, then it is liberating because you can, you can choose not to embrace that. And, um, and so I've actually been astonished by the reception of this book within conservative evangelical communities. I had no idea how many would, um, would read it first of all, yeah. <laughs> you know, with the title and subtitle and, and then how many would uh, receive it with such humility, with such openness, with such enthusiasm. And I mean, that's, that's been a remarkable experience for me as a writer. And uh, again, I, I kind of, that's where I see the redrawing of some of these boundaries, uh, around a different kind of Christianity. And I would love to see where that goes next. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, two, two final questions. So historic, historically, we've seen evangelicals kind of double down at, at times like this when they face the opposition, I guess. So and I think maybe the question a lot of people are wondering, too, is and it's maybe impossible to know at this point. But looking back, do you think we'll see Trump sort of as it's just he's so extreme, right? So yes. like, does this it feels like it could be the appropriate end to a movie, but it also yeah. could be setting up a sequel like you know yes, it's like hard yeah. to know right now like do, do you have any sense on that based on just looking at history I think I've answered that question to four different journalists just today so <laughs> so I have this answer all ready to go and it's not it's not a Let's great one because who knows okay. uh but um no so so historically speaking you're absolutely right that when evangelicals have found themselves uh out of power uh, when Republicans aren't in the White House, when they don't have that access to power, it tends to really strengthen and radicalize their movement. Uh, so, uh, you know, under uh, Reagan's presidency, a lot of the organizations in the religious right kind of, you know, fell apart. <laughs> it, it was hard to drum up support when Reagan was in the White House. Same thing with, you know, George W. Bush and uh, not so when it was Obama in the White House. That's when you see this real strengthening and radicalization. Now, Trump is different. And this is where, you know, so on the one hand, we could expect that, um, that now, you know, this is just going to stoke the, the, the fires of resentment and embattlement, and it's going to further radicalize. That is certainly in the realm of possibility, and there'd be historical precedent for that. But, but Trump is an aberration in that he, <laughs> He, his genius was to hold power, to share power with evangelicals, right? To raise them up and to favor them and simultaneously to stoke and fuel this resentment and sense of abandonment among evangelicals all at the same time. And um, we hadn't seen that before. And so, so he was really remarkable in that. And so that's why I don't know what's going to happen next because 
um, he, he's still around, but he's not powerful anymore. You know, he's just on the golf cart course. As far as I know, he doesn't even have a Twitter platform anymore. And so, uh, what does that do to the movement that really did coalesce around him? Um, and if, if they are, you know, the, I can't say that we aren't going to see radicalization. I'm not sure that it's going to happen around Trump at this point. And so if it's mm. going to be diffuse, if there's going to be infighting, it might not be able to kind of mobilize in a united way, as we saw under, you know, the eight years of the Obama administration, um, as we saw during the Clinton administration back in the nineties, you know, this kind of strengthening of, uh, conservative religious organizations, um, so I'll, that's a long way of saying I have no idea what's going to happen yeah. next, but I keep watching. Wow. Yeah, it does feel it does feel different under Trump, I guess, than if you say like a, a Bush or a Reagan or something like that, yeah. for sure. Um, okay, last question. I mean, our listeners, almost radical title of the show, our listeners don't really need to be convinced, I guess, like they're the ones that are just nodding their heads the whole time. They. Yeah. Um, they would feel peace from reading your book, I think, because it's like, yes, this is what I've, this is what I've been feeling. This is what I've been thinking. Um, and this gives words to it, but they do have to have dinner with friends and family that, um, would still are still in that evangelical circle. Yeah. Um, and it often feels like there's this wall between us and them. And, uh, yeah, so I guess, I, I guess the question is, do, do you feel like there are any, cracks or holes in the wall of evangelicalism that those of us sort of on the outside can use maybe to help those still on on the inside or in in evangelicalism to maybe start seeing some of this stuff that that you're that you're sharing uh, there there are no shortcuts here uh, that i've discovered uh there there are no kind of easy fixes um the most important thing is to stay in relationship, I think, uh, to, um, to both stay in relationship and also speak truth. Now it doesn't have to be Facebook screeds. It doesn't have to be, you know, like sitting down for an hour heart to heart before you have dinner or, you know, ruining a family birthday party or anything like that. Sure. But I think just, you know, making sure that those in your circles know, what you think, what you believe and, and what distresses you, uh, because often those things even go unspoken. And so, so these differences have been papered over for a very long time. And I think it's important that people know that you know, those who are close to them have, have different, um, you know, deeply different views on some of these really important issues. Uh, I had the luxury of 300 pages and a whole lot of footnotes to make my case. And so, and, and what I found is that that has worked really well, uh, right? To, 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 again, to show how we got to this point. And that is really hard to do in a 15 minute conversation. It really, really is because again, we're coming to these issues. You know, we can open the Bible in front of us or we can, we can talk about this current event or even this historical event in a snapshot. And we're gonna just be coming at it from such different places, really almost different realities. Um, and that's even before the whole, you know, uh, fake news phenomenon and, and these echo chambers. And, and it is really, really difficult. Um, and so, so I don't have a quick fix. I, I just yeah. feel really grateful that I was able to write this book. Um, and I, I, I have, you know, Twitter is, is awesome for um, kind of getting to experience the life of the book uh, uh, after it's been released and to see people say, you know, I shared this with my dad. I shared this with my parents. You know, they're reading it right now and they're, and they're, you know, apologizing or they're coming to terms wow. with this. Uh, yeah, there's this, this gorgeous uh, uh, tweet about, um, you know, I shared this with my dad and you know, he resisted it all the way through until the last chapter. And then, um, you know, he, um, he apologized. He apologized for how he raised wow. us. He apologized for being a part, for being complicit in this. And I've heard so many stories um, like that of people wow. realizing that, you know, the, the most frequent response I get, I, I get letters every day from readers. The most frequent one is this is the story of my life. And, um, and what's been really remarkable to me is how many people who participated in this are not trying to distance themselves from it, not saying, but I had some good reasons for doing this, not at all. 
Uh, again, these are the people who are writing to me, but, uh, but they're saying, you know, I was complicit in this and I need to come to terms with this and I need to change. And it's, it's really been um, absolutely remarkable to, to hear so many stories like that. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. Wow. Well, Dr. Jimmy, I really appreciate this. And thank you so much for this. I had no idea it was, I mean, I knew it, take, it took you a long time. I had no idea that you had spent 15, 16 years um, on this, had to put it aside for a while and, and then come back to it. And, um, but thank you for this work. I think it's, um, it's going to live on for a long time as uh, more people discover it. And hopefully more people have those same experiences that, uh, that some of those people writing you have had. Um, but yeah, thank you for this. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation.